Hello, welcome to the second season of Schmuzik with the American Friends of the Israel Philharmonic. Thank you for joining us. Um, just to remind everyone, because it's been a few months since we've been together, this is an interactive program. And so we encourage you to please ask questions. There is a, a field below your, your screen where you can um, ask questions. Also, since we've, we've started our second season, we'd love your ideas about any guests that you'd like to see us interview. Um, although we love interviewing very prominent celebrities like we are today, we also like interviewing um, artists or musicians or composers um, or creators of any type who are more up and coming, who you might know about that you think others should know about too. So please email events at afipo.org with any ideas. I'm Danielle Aim Spivak. I'm the CEO of the Friends of the Israel Philharmonic. I had the pleasure of meeting in person this summer, our guest today, Tova Felju. I have been a fan of Tova's for years and years since I saw Tova playing Golda in Golda's Balcony. So this is you know, a decades long dream for me to have the opportunity to talk to you in depth. And I'll do a little bit of a formal introduction of you in a second, Tova, but I just wanna say that I read your memoir, Lilyville, sorry, Lilyville, and I recommend it to everyone. Oh good, you have it there too. I know it's available on Amazon. Are there any other uh, books Amazon, you recommend? Amazon, Target, Barnes and Nobles. And if you're buying it in bulk, which many of my wonderful sponsors have, you can get a hold of BookPal. They give a marvelous and substantial discount. And for those of you who don't have time to read, though I prefer you to get the hardcover, I do do the audiobook and I do I do all the voices. And this is the voice of my mother, Lily. So I could keep you company with the audiobook, which is on Audible. Lilyville, mother, daughter, and other roles I've played. Thank you, Danielle. Well, that's going to be one of my first questions to you, because obviously that's an interesting element that you don't necessarily expect when you pick up your memoir, um, that so much of it will reflect on your relationship with your mother. But um, although I'm sure a lot of people watching and listening know a lot about you already, I'll just remind everyone that you're a multi Emmy and Tony nominated actress. You have multiple honorary doctorates. Um, you've been honored for your theater work in by the Drama Desks, four Outer Critics Circle Awards, three Drama Logs, the Obie, the Theater World, and the Helen Hayes and Lucille Lortel Awards for Best Actress. And you've been recently nominated as Best Actress in a Drama in LA for your work in the play Sisters-in-Law about uh, your role as Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yes, and, and I've just been offered a musical called Justice, which I'm, I'm going to look at. It starts well out of town, and it's just in development, but I was so honored to be offered a musical role for the Supreme Court Justice because she always wanted to be an opera star. And she, there were, I think, there were robins and then there were larks in her grade school chorus, and the larks were asked to sing and the robins were asked to mouth the lyrics and not sing. And she was a robin. We told her not to sing. So I think that's the ultimate irony. But I obviously, who doesn't love playing Ruth Bader Ginsburg? You know? So you haven't committed to that yet, but you're considering it? No, I'm considering it. That's right. The offer just came in. And of course, it's an offer. I figure, why shouldn't, why shouldn't I share it? Well, thank you. That's very exciting um, was, yeah. to hear about. So... I'll start a little bit with your memoir. There's so much I'd like to cover today, but we're going to open it up to questions because it's so important for us to, to let the audience participate in the discussion. So I'll just show the book again, Mother, Daughter, and Other Roles I've Played, Lilyville. What an amazing title. Um, I was really interested to learn, and I think you mentioned it when we met in person too, that uh, you were a pianist growing up. Yes. And that was heavily influenced, obviously, by your mother. So. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing, of course, why you decided to focus so much of your memoir on your mother, um, what it was like for you as a child. Well, first of all, I had, I had a wonderful childhood and I have wonderful parents and they were married for 63 years. And my parents-in-law 
were married for 63 years and my grandparents were married for 63 years. So there hasn't been a divorce in our direct line probably for 200 years. There may have been miserable marriages that I'm not aware about and aware of in Minsk, Abernia in the 1830s and 40s, but I don't think there was a divorce. So I, I came from a very solid home. My father was a GI in the war and his fluency in German, his parents were uh, Austrian and German. So he was fluent in German, saved his life. And when my father was dying from the effects of a stroke and he was a Harvard lawyer and a litigator, he spoke only in German in the first sounds he heard as a child. But that German took him from the infantry as a 32 year old lawyer, had been practicing for 10 years, but my mother and father couldn't have children. And they blew into my mother's fallopian tubes as a diagnostic to say, Lily, I think it's time to adopt. My father got drafted and David was conceived. So there, there are not only miracles, but the, Amer the will of a human being is, um, is, is a serious, uh, something to be considered uh, a serious um, entity. Uh, my father and mother, my father was in the intelligence during the war, so he didn't come home until 1946. So David didn't have a daddy for two years of his life. I was his baby born after the war and he never left my side. I think once you know death, and if you don't believe me, check with the South Koreans or the Israelis. Once you know death, you grab the golden ring of life. You take nothing for granted. And the one, it's not a blessing, but the one upside of this horrendous pandemic is the gratitude it fosters in all of us simply for our health, simply for testing negative, which I did last night and just took my PCR because I've been in Utah for eight days and on two planes and I never fly. so. Um, I'm hoping I, that came out negative and I, I'm assuming I'm in very good health, but I'm going to take a PCR and I'll wait for that result too, because I have grandchildren who are not inoculated. In all events, I grew up, my father, the minute I was born, bought an acre of land in Scarsdale, New York, because it had the best school system, public school, as did Beverly Hills High and New Trier at that time. And he built my mother her dream house. He promised her those things in his love letters. They did not come from wealth, though my father's family was fancy. They were very well educated, and my father lost his father at 16, went to NYU instead of the Ivy League, and then got a scholarship to Harvard. And my mother put herself through NYU, and that's how they, they met. But my father promised my mother she would never have to wonder where she could buy her next pair of shoes. And he built her this home on a hill, as he promised he would, and I was brought up in that home by a father who loved life and trusted life. When I rode my bike, they said, my father said, be home by sunset. And my mother said, be careful. So it was um, two different messages. Um, my mother played the piano very well. She was the pianist for Walden High School for Girls in the Bronx and did all the Gilbert and Sullivan's uh, for them. And I became a pianist to get close to my mother. And I can only tell you, as is explicated in the book, we never played a duet. And that metaphor is deep, which brings me to why Lilyville is a story about a mother-daughter relationship, or really a parent-child relationship. Because I always seek, as I'm sure you do in your work, what is the metaphor for what we're doing? What, what is, get out of the literal world and what is the universal? Well, I didn't want to write about my little ups and downs as a Broadway entity. I'm not, I know I'm not an international brand. I'm not Tom Cruise. I'm, you know, I'm not a big movie star. I'm a, I'm a Broadway girl, more of a local girl, and I've done a good deal of television. So I said, I've got to hit a universal so that if somebody in Tanzania gets a hold of this book, it'll mean something to them. And so I went for the parent child, since we're all children of parents, and what the, what the tremendous elements are of primary imprinting, the primary messages sent to a child. And from my mother and father, they were different messages, not necessarily contradictory, but different. And I very soon into my life took after my father, which is why the book is called Lilyville. Sydneyville would be about two pages long without conflict. But Lilyville has a great deal of conflict. My mother was brought up with much more fear and much more suspicion of the planet than, than I was. You know. uh -huh. And she transmitted that to me. And also she was silent. She came from an and her parents came from England and from before that Minsk Abernia, my grandfather Minsk Abernia, my grandmother from London. And I guess they didn't want to give a cane of her to their children by praising them because I can tell you my mother did not praise me. She didn't even say I love you. 
until I was 18. And I asked her, I was already at Sarah Lawrence, and I said, do you love me? And it was right out of Fiddler. She goes, do I love you? What are you talking about? Who takes you to Rita Chase and for dance? Who takes you to, to your piano lessons? Did you practice today? Who takes you to Hebrew school? Who buys you? Who buys you the clothes? at Saks Fifth Avenue and Lord and Taylor's. We only buy undergarments at Alexander's. Who makes you your nutcake? Who does these, you know? She was a mitzvah machine, but one of duty, and maybe she wasn't as happy with her life as she might have been in the years that I was growing up. You know, I don't know. So I wrote this book about these two different big, strong trees, a tova and a lily. Uh, what happens with a mother, with a daughter who thinks you can have it all in life, and a mother who thinks you can't, well, do they get along and they don't. And eventually she lived so long till over 103 that our branches bowered together. We became extremely intimate, particularly after the death of my father. And she lived over 18 years after the death of my father. Well, there's so much there we could go deeper on. Um, but something that comes to mind is I imagine when you are preparing for your role of playing RBG, you tied a lot into her own interesting relationship with her mother. Um, and obviously your story is different in that your mother did live a very long life, thankfully. Um, so I imagine that your deeper reflections about your own life have really helped in a lot of the roles that you've played. Yes, and, and, and the point is, you, for the audience's sake, as a, let us say, as a master storyteller, I hope I am, I'm, done it for 50 years. This is my 50th year in equity. I was a spear carrier at the Guthrie Theater and never got promoted. So I I didn't, I want you to know, I didn't give up. <laughs> I was a spear carrier and remained a spear carrier. And then they put me in the chorus of Cyrano and it would open up at the Palace Theater on Broadway and change your place, change your luck. But um, in terms of RBG, she had a great mentor, which was her mother. When I asked the justice about her father, she said, he wasn't much. Just like that. When I asked the justice, I said, you know, Madam Justice, I'm going to be your theatrical voice out in the universe. I'm so honored to make this Los Angeles premiere of this play. How do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be thought of? And I swear to God, Danielle, she went like this, you know, her posture. Mm -hmm. I want them to know I'm funny. <laughs> I thought I was going to lose it. And actually, she was, she was rather uh, clever and so cultured. And yeah, her mother died the day before she would graduate from high school and she was a valedictory. Well, was how, a valedictory. how is it different preparing for roles when the person you're playing, the figure is still alive versus if they've passed away? Well, it's fabulous. It's very convenient. Now, Golda had so much footage on her, but I didn't have any molecular interchange with, with Golda Meir. But with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I was with her four times and she was very generous and she's very smart, obviously she's brilliant, but she's smart. She said, here's this kid, um, Broadway. I, I remember somebody sent me a note that she had sent a friend that she doesn't, didn't know I saw. She said, I'm excited about the play. This one, this actress I've heard is terribly good, this actress. So it means the play was done before and she wasn't uh, so pleased. When Golda Meir first saw Golda on Broadway before it was made into Golda's Balcony, she, she turned, it was by, starring Anne Bancroft about 25 years before Golda's Balcony was written, and she turned to, at the end of the, the open night curtain, she turned to the person next to her, it was Bobby Simka Dinitz, and she said, you think Israel has problems? And she was referring to the first draft of the Gibson play. Okay, um, well, that's actually an interesting question, because it's very controversial right now, the idea of who can play who. If you're from a different cultural background, can you play someone uh, who's a different religion or nationality than you? What are your thoughts on that? I think you absolutely can. I believe in a meritocracy. I believe in the best person for the best job. I recently lost a job based on my race. So it goes both ways, based on my color. I had a job, the contract was signed, I had to be paid off. And because there was a different social atmosphere, they said, we're so sorry, we're going, we've decided to make your part another ethnicity. So it was very, very interesting. It goes- So they were the honest about the reason why they were- They were, they were, and they did pay me. And also not only would I never sue, but should I have sued, I was on the wrong side of that narrative and I would mm -hmm. never do it. Mm -hmm. So um, there are certain 
ethnic groups that have not had their shot and they're getting their shot. They're big time getting their shot. And I, I think that's great. But uh, above that, above that, I believe in a meritocracy and Helen Mirren is one of the greatest actresses in the Western Hemisphere. Come on. And a great friend of the Israel Philharmonic. So we're big fans I, of her. I, you know, I, the key to her is she's British. She was brought up in Britain, but her parenting is Russian. Mm. So you have the best. She has this huge emotional instrument covered by a veneer of refinement mm -hmm. and elegance. And married to a great guy, Taylor Hackford, who directed me in The Idolmaker. I, I would never have gotten the roles I got. I, I got my Tony nomination for Best Actress in a Musical for playing Dona Flor, uh, a, a Brazilian woman. It mm -hmm. uh, was called Sarava, but the play, part was Dona Flor, and I put on Egyptian three every night. I looked like Lena Horne. Would never have gotten that part. Uh, there's no um, uh, Carol Lawrence, who played Maria. Would never have gotten Maria. Not going to cast a Caucasian Jewish girl as Maria, but in those days, Whoever sang the best got the part, I guess. Maybe I'm being naive, uh, but uh, uh, people who were great, like Cheetah Rivera, there are plenty of Latino actors that were brilliant. What about Lin-Manuel himself, just himself? He's played all sorts of things. He's been in Disney films playing Dick Van Dyke's part. So come on, um, I believe in a meritocracy, that's how I feel. So you've obviously been in Hollywood for a long time. In addition to being um, a stage actress, you've also been in shows as popular as Law and Order and the film Kissing Jessica Stein. As a woman who's been in Hollywood for so long, uh, you've seen a lot of trends and evolutions to the industry, especially in the last five years or so. Um, you have a perspective because of your experience and the type of formats and contexts you've worked in. So I'm kind of curious, you know, do you feel things are better off for women today in Hollywood than they, they were 20 or 30 or 40 years ago? Yeah, for sure. I mean, yes, they are. And um, look, if Betty White was a star till 99, things are better. You have people like Jane Fonda and Lily Tomlin and people who insist on still functioning, which I hope to do. I mean, I just finished playing Ruth Bader, kid and Ruth Bader, playing Ruth K. Westheimer, Dr. Ruth. And it was a very complicated play. And uh, it was on my shoulders and it was an honor to do it. But this is a part, just like Golda. Golda starts at 80 in the show. And I was doing it in my 40s. Well, now I'm no longer in my 40s. You know, I'm much closer to her age. So um, I say to women, as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she saw the glass ceiling and she armed herself with, with brass knuckles. You mentioned Dr. Ruth, who obviously is also a close friend of the Israel Philharmonic, and we and we love her as a person, obviously. Tell you mentioned there were some challenges with that. I'm curious what they were. Well, first of all, it was it, it was marvelous. This was really marvelous because I was with the justice and then the justice died. So I, I had her four times. I have my picture, I have I can study her, but I don't have the footage like I have of Ruth. I have Ruth in and myself dancing. I have Ruth and myself uh, talking, doing Q&As. She's a living, vibrant presence in my life. I would go to her apartment every Wednesday and study her speech pattern. There were complications in the play, but we work with the best playwright in the world, Mark St. Germain, because this play was written nine years ago, and he was ready to revamp some of it for our sake. And I'm sorry, but that made all the difference. At least for me, it did. At least for me, it did. I think when you're in a one-woman vehicle, whether it's Golda, or whether it's it's Ruth K. Westheimer, the script has to sound like the actors made it up. That's how close it has to be to the skin of the actor. So that's the actor's job. But if certain things are, ugh, you need a wonderful playwright to, that you can go to and say, can I put it this way instead of that way? And when he says yes, it's great. So I would say the the becoming Doctor Ruth that we are doing is is not full is not published. I would say it's, it's not drastically changed, but our version is definitely a version that was custom made for the work that Scott Schwartz, my director, and I did at Bay Street and then carried on to the Museum of Jewish Heritage. And we had a, a boffo run. We made a lot of money for the museum. We, we did very well for 30 performances and COVID. I had matinees for 45 people, but other ones were sold out. So it, it took a great deal of courage to come to the theater. And 
I hope to take this play on to off Broadway or Broadway. I, I'm optimistic maybe, but I, I think you might be as well that people are craving that live experience more than ever before and are ready to return. Absolutely, they're ready. We just gotta make sure that the health, health is ready. I, I, many producers will not produce anything now until the spring, they won't touch anything. With this last spike and Music Man closing down for 10 days because Hugh Jackman got COVID. You know, if you're singing and you're breathing all over each other, your chances of getting ill are very, very high. Uh, becoming Dr. Ruth is a one woman play. So I did not have a problem. She's so, so optimistic. She's so optimistic that even the ends of her sentences go up. Oh, I could listen to you, you know, playing any of your roles, even Thank their you. accents any time of day. I do want to say I love about the, the memoir that you call each chapter a scene which is enjoyable and, and fresh. And in scene seven, I think it starts the, the chapter or the scene where you say, there I was starring on Broadway in Yentl while Lily, which is who, who was your mother, was lighting Shabbat candles, praying I would find a husband. And <laughs> which you did, you found a husband, Andrew, and you've had a very, what seems from at least the memoir and what I've heard from you, um, a happy long marriage, but I am curious, you know, what it was like to feel that you were there on Broadway on Yentl and your mother was home lighting Shabbat candles and thinking about who you're going to marry, which was, by the way, very typical for the time. That's what was expected of women and for many today still as well. So I love that part. Thank you. I, look, she wanted, uh, she didn't tell me to go to college to get my MRS degree. And she didn't stand in my way of being an actor, but she didn't lift a finger for my career. I was on my own. I think my brother David was pretty much too, though they sent, he got a scholarship to Lambda and then they helped him financially when he was in London, but that's expected. He was educate, being educated. Me, I was financially independent the minute I finished my, my BA at Sarah Lawrence. Um, you know, it's not like my mother lit the candles every Friday night and didn't come to, didn't come to the play. We are assimilated conservative Jews from, Temple Israel Center in uh, in White Plains, New York, where I was bat mitzvah and was the only bat mitzvah from Quakerid school. People were very busy assimilating at that time in the 50s and 60s. The war just ended. And though there were no Mercedes or Toyotas in Scarsdale to speak of, people did not buy Japanese cars till the 60s when your first car could be a Volkswagen. I remember that with some of the Jewish families would buy their children a little Volkswagen. I didn't. I got the old, whatever was left, whatever, the oldest Chrysler in the in the driveway I was allowed to drive. Um, in all events, my mother's, that, that sentence is not an exaggeration, but it's a juxtaposition to show that my mother's values were not my values. And when I actually married a Harvard lawyer like she did, she was very relieved. The story of my wedding, when I had already won all these awards on Broadway and she came to me, they were, it was right before the Bedeckin when the veil is going down. She said, Tova darling can do whatever you want now. And I thought for sure she's saying, go to Hollywood, make movies. She could say, she said, you're marrying a Harvard lawyer. So that was, that was but her in, value. And she built a She built ways, a Though you, Tova, you, you did create a life where you've had it all. And I mean that in the best way possible. I'm a woman that happens to believe we should try to have everything we want and not limit ourselves. And you have had an amazing family life and children and grandchildren. Um, and a career. So, and you did it way before a lot of women felt that they could do all of that at the same time. I had some, I won't say genetic luck, luck but I had some, some socialization that was so appropriate. My values were so strong about having a good family. In my family, if you can't bring up your children, you go like this, you're a flea, and you're nothing. And, you know, I write about this. I say, marry like a Jew, divorce like a Catholic. I really chose carefully because once I have children, I'm not, I'm not going, I've seen what it does to children. So all our big pillars are in place and still are. Incidentally, the third act of the marriage, if you marry for love, is the most romantic, the most, the sweetest, it's, it's sweet. It's like a ripened honey crisp apple and it's still crisp, but it's so sweet because you understand death. You've buried your parents. Your children are on their own. We have two wonderful children. 
uh, Garson Brandon Levy, our son, who's married to Jamie Kirk, and uh, Amanda Claire Levy Rizzoe, who's married to Joel Rizzoe. And they live close and uh, will be together for Shabbat. We have a Zoom Shabbat in our family. We're on our 92nd Zoom Shabbat. I send out 118 emails. I know because I just sent out this announcement to the Zoom family. And about 15, 18 screens show up every Friday. They vary. And uh, the ones that I count on, of course, mine and Andy's, Brandon and Jamie and their child, Sydney, Sydney May Levy, and Joel and Amanda and their children, Raphael and Camille. And, uh, and Jamie, uh, who converted to Judaism, is expecting, they're expecting their second child in April. So I'm very excited. So your enthusiasm about all the exciting things you continue to do in your life is, it's very, um, it, it gives us a sense of hope, I guess, that, that newness can continue um, regardless of generation. And I loved that you hiked Kilimanjaro and you talk about that in your memoir. What are some other things that are on your list that you want to achieve in the next year or five years? Well, my dream is to do eight shows a week, probably off Broadway, of three one-woman shows. Goldest Balcony as a Prime Minister, uh, Becoming Dr. Ruth, Ruth K. Westheimer, and to commission a play about the Supreme Court Justice. So that a tourist can come to New York and see a Prime Minister, a Supreme Court Justice, and an international sex therapist within 24 hours. And I was trained in rep, so I would, I would do, you know, well, 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 that, that is my artistic dream. How does your mind, how does your mind switch between those characters so easily? Different, different, really different channels. It's like, uh, I'm going to play my father. My father talked like this because he was a litigator. So I said, dad, is this the way you talked when you were a baby? Did your mother go lullaby and good night? If I'm going to play my mother, it's a different, it's a different sound. It's a different tune. You know, you turn the page, you get another piece of music. And then you got her, you got her speech pattern. So it's a, it's a different a tunnel with a different preparation. And you get to the theater by five and you start getting what I call in the tunnel. I just thought it would be stunning to do it. I can do it. And as I'm a senior citizen and it would really engender hope in other people and it would keep me sharp. So that's one of my dreams. But the other dream is I want to star in a TV series of Lilyville. Mm -hmm. And I would love to play my mother and myself. And then you could have two Emmy nominations for one actress in the same series. That, that's, my, that's my jerky dreams. I mean, you know. Anyway, I, if I did Lilyville, I would obviously play Lily. But um, it has been optioned. And uh, we are hoping to make it into a television series. So those are my, my two artistic desires. My other desires is I'd like to go to the, you know, the area of the North Pole through Alaska. I've been to about 95 countries. I've been to a lot of countries. And the most thrilling trip I ever took was in Rwanda tracking the mountain gorilla. That was, I am so proud to be related to a gorilla. I cannot tell you. They are fabulous. And if you're wondering about the family bed and whether to let your children in the bed, watch the gorillas. They're all, the babies are all over their parents. They're lying on their parents. They're picking the nits. It's just a scream. Um, so in, I, in terms of those, those are, those are my artistic choices. And my personal choice is, of course, I would like to see, we're married 45 years in March. I would certainly at least like to see our 63rd anniversary, like my father and mother. And um, as I get older, you know, the family values get deeper and deeper because that's where your immortality is, particularly for a Jew, because we name our children after the honored dead. So I know that I'm the legacy for my, that my, my grandchildren are my legacy and I'm their heritage. Margaret Mead says, grandchildren find their place in the universe, not through the parents, but through their grandparents. And I had my grandparents. I had the stories of Russia and the shtetl. I had the stories of London and, and London Jewish speech. You name peace past the matzah, matzah, you hear the dentalization. When you go to the five towns in Long Island, they sometimes say, I went to the dentist, I saw the dentist, I said, surely, did you get your teeth done? So instead of D, you have a TS. That's the same thing with the British accent. So for darling, so for darling. Does she look gorgeous? She looks gorgeous. Please pass the mouth, sir. You must walk into a store or a party 
and your radar for picking up on linguistic tendencies and right. behavioral mannerisms must you know, go off in your head. Is that true? I, I love it. I love it. On the plane, I saw a documentary of a man in search of the 100 foot wave. And I understood it. It's not my search, but he was obsessed with the perfection and he did it. And he was in his middle years. So I'm endlessly fascinated by the sounds and the movements of other people, which is probably why I became an actor and love being in all of your all of your company. I prefer it face to face, but I'll take Zoom. I'll take Zoom when I can get it. I, I'm trying to think of the next exotic. Oh yes, before the pandemic came out, I was going to go to Ethiopia to look at the Jewish community and go into the desert. God knows, you know, I've been to Africa five or six times. That's because I take what I earn and I buy experience. I don't buy diamonds. I don't need any diamonds at this stage of my life. I don't buy fur coats that are going to spray us. I buy experience including, let's say, a great teacher. Like if there's a great voice teacher, he says, well, I'm $300 an hour, I'm $400 an hour. I'm not saying I'll take an infinite amount of lessons, but I will, I will, I will earn that money and pay that teacher for their time. Um, Zach, I think this is a great moment. I, I'd love to continue just talking alone to Tova, but I want to let everyone have the opportunity. I know you're there somewhere in the background. Hi, Danielle. Hi, Tova. Um, Hi, honey. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm watching uh, our chat. We have a few questions coming in. Looks like a lot of you are pretty speechless about this conversation, so please make sure to get your questions in that chat underneath the video. Um, I also just want to say that we have linked Lilyville in the comments, so you can go purchase it on Amazon Target. Uh, you can just click right to that. So, Tova, we have uh, the first question is from Ashley in LA about probably your most high, one of your most high profile roles as Deanna on The Walking Dead. Um, they want to know a little bit about that process, specifically the makeup and what it's like getting into the makeup uh, for a role like that. Which, which was the role? I didn't hear what role. The Walking Dead? The walk, Yeah, what? Deanna on, on The Walking Dead. Well, first of all, Deanna Monroe wore no makeup, almost no makeup until I was bitten. Until you were bitten. <laughs> and then it took two days to decide on the prosthesis for my cheeks. I was sent to New York for special uh, contact lenses so I could have those weird eyes. And they asked me, do I want to play a walker? That's what they were called. We're not allowed to use the Z word on the set. I said, sure, because uh, certain actors worry about their dignity. I would worry about my dignity if I played a terrorist that wanted to kill um, Jewish people, you know, then then I would turn the role down because I have no doubt that I would make that person, that terrorist, very sympathetic if I were doing it. So it's now on that. But in terms of walking around like a walker at the end of my two year marvelous tenure um, uh, as Deanna Monroe, it was a very interesting experience. And in the middle of it, the boy who played my son, his mother died. His actual mother died. Then he had the scene with me where he discovered me in the forest, you know, walking around and he had to kill me. Um, as, as a second part of that question, they wanted to know if there's any like, if you can give any behind the scenes comments about Alexandria or its inhabitants that maybe only you'd know or some like tidbits. Um, uh, well, I, I don't want to lush in horror, you know, I'm not here to gossip. Alexandria was a real town. People bought real estate in it. And I guess AMC was rich enough to take over that whole complex before they sold it as real estate. This was really, and the showrunner, Scott Gimple lived in that set he would sleep at night in one of those units and it wasn't a set it was it was built as a as something to sell and i was very thrilled to be in the walking dead as a protagonist not as a an evildoer let us say and also it was not a jewish role it was uh, a lot going on here uh not a jewish role she was an ex-senator from the midwest and had found a way to save some of her flock let us say mm -hmm. from from the uh, invasion of these walkers. You know, again, what's the metaphor here? That's what you wanna look for in your life. The metaphor for the walking dead, of course, is what? Is, is the pandemic. 
pandemic is the walkers. When we got that COVID before we had inoculations and people were dying in the hundreds, in the hundreds, I, I got COVID uh, by February 25th, 26th of 2020 till March 19th. And then we moved out to our summer home for the rest of the year. But people were dying. So how do you stay well? How do you fortify yourself? Where, where, where do you speak to people? So those, the metaphor for those horrendous pandemic problems were actually explicated in a series like The Walking Dead. That's the primal, um, the, the primal struggle between the civilized, the human being, the homo sapien, and the uncivilized, the walker, or the uncivilized forces of, of life. People who go into high schools and kill our youth. These, this underbelly or this um, government of hate that was fostered uh, from 2016 to 2020, where the country splintered. Outrageous. Big step backward. Big step. It's it's really it's it's really interesting to hear you at least sedate it like that uh, in that context uh, with the Walking Dead and, and the pandemic. We yeah. have. It just hit it just hit me as we're speaking. I always look for the metaphor. You don't have to, but that's what works for me. That's why Lilyville was the mother daughter relationship. I I didn't feel I was important enough to just tell you about the little details of my little life, my little life. You know. Where where's the where's the metaphor? The only thing the transformational actor does, and I do consider myself a transformational actor, is if I can play Peter Pan, think what you can do. If I can do a full out trapeze act in my sixties on Broadway in Pippin while singing No Time at All, think what you can do. If I can do Golden Mayor and I'm a size six and she's a size sixteen, think what you can do. That's where the possibility is. Judith wants to say, I just want to sneak her comment in here. She said that she had the privilege of seeing you in Toronto several times and nice. uh, you are an amazing performer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Danielle, I'll, I'll throw it back to you if you have a few more questions. Um, when, if another question rolls in, I'll, I'll jump in, but I, I know you have a whole list. Well, I, I like that you brought up, um, you know, the fact that you played roles that have nothing to do with being Jewish. Absolutely. And Matter of fact, they're my respite. Have you ever felt pigeonholed as being the Jewish actress? I mean, you're not, not until recently, not until recently. But, you know, I'm so old, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. You give me a great role, I'll play it. If you want me to play a pigeon that talks, I'll play it because it'd be an interesting idea. The idea that Justice Ginsburg would sing in a, in a musical where she's the title role, I'll, I'll, I'll take that on. That sounds very interesting to me. Not until recently, and that's because, very simple, Golda, RBG, Ruth Westheimer. I'm like the go-to lady in certain for certain films, but I just played the Jewish wife of Sir Anthony Hopkins, and our daughter was Anne Hathaway. So I say, if you're going to be pigeonholed, be global. Be as, be, make that, make that, make a global commitment to your uh, ethnic typing. Uh, so yes, I'm, I'm offered, there's a pile of scripts with the same offer in it and I mostly turn them down. It is, it is not my job, forgive me now, it is not my job to play a supporting player in a Jewish piece. Not me, and certainly not on stage. In a movie, in a major movie, that's a different situation because when you film in any movie, you're. You're the major player for that day. So when Tony and I were filming our scenes, we were the people, that's all they, they, they we were with everybody. You know, we're, we didn't have small parts, we had huge parts. It's just a question of how often those parts appear on screen in the whole story. So for film, I can budge, but for theater, I'm not playing somebody's mother unless the play is called The Mother. <laughs> uh, and in terms of being pigeonholed, all you do is start saying no. I always, I'm more like Ruth Westheimer. Uh, she says, I learned long ago, always take the yes, always take the yes. So like when you asked me to do ish music, I took the yes. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to help, I'm no hero, but when good causes ask me to pitch in, what's, what's to lose? It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we met at such a wonderful woman's house. Such a great guy. I'm not allowed, I don't know if I'm allowed to announce it yet, but I, but I hope that the friend that we met, the mutual friend will be a future music guest this year. So, I, hope so too. I, hope so too. Um, I, 
I, I have one last question, although I'd like to ask more, but it's almost Shabbat on the East Coast. I want to respect the fact that you have your family Zoom uh-huh. gatherings and a lot of people watching probably have other things to do this afternoon. Sure. I'd love to know what rituals you have, whether they're before you go on stage or what you have for breakfast in the morning. How do you, how do you recharge when you're back-to-back nights on stage or back-to-back matinees? What do you do in your private time or with your family that really optimizes you know, how you handle and how you function? How beautiful, what a beautiful and profound question. Well, normally, uh, and not this morning or yesterday, but I, I just skied for six days. And I mean, I, I skied, uh, like I climbed Kilimanjaro. I am a good skier. And I took typical Tove, I took nine hours of lessons. Uh, it was called the Max Four, where there were only four students. And two of those days, there was only myself and one other person. One was Adam Pasternak, a Jewish boy from Harvard Business School, who could have been my son. And the other one was a wonderful woman um, from named Melissa Roy from Detroit. And then we had a group of four the third time. And then the fourth day, I went with a guide for free. You can tour all of Deer Valley and they'll take you down the intermediate slopes and some advanced intermediate slopes. I have no ambition about being a fabulous skier, just to be safe and enjoy. So I finished that and I thought my knees were going to pop out of my body. So um, one thing I have to t- clear up if I want to keep skiing is to get my knees in order, which brings me to my swimming. I swim a mile a day usually. Get up in the morning, I bike to the two pools I have access to in New York City, and I swim a mile a day. It takes me 45 minutes and bike back. And that's what I usually do. Now, when I was doing the one-person play, I could not do all that. I could not. I would do it only on my days off. And that's a difference in being a senior citizen and when I was an actress in my 40s because I could do, do, much, do much more without flagging. But you need to have the cream of your energy for these um, one-person shows. You need to be sharp and well-rested. And since the pandemic, again, we're all supposed to get eight hours sleep. And they're not kidding. And at my age, if you don't get proper sleep, it's supposed to lead to dementia. Can you imagine? Forget about it. You're looking at Betty White right here. I'm going to be working till I'm 100, and I'm not dying till I'm 104, Danielle. I have a, I have a covenant with God. So anyway, I, I exercise in the morning. Today I walked uh, about five miles to get uh, the rapid te- the PCR test, and I walked to another appointment and back, so that was great. And I am studying these scripts that are offers and helping the people who optioned Lilyville to make this into a series. And mostly as I get older, and I don't know that this is original, my family values get deeper and deeper. Because of this pandemic, and I'm not kosher, but I am somewhat observant and having to run. I produce these Shabbats every Friday and we're literally on our 92nd and I produce this Zoom Seder. And I don't know what we're going to do this year for the Seder. I guess we'll Zoom for a while and then I'll have a small Seder in person with the immediate family. But I, I lean on Judaism, the rituals of Judaism, the idea that to be a good Jew, you have to, you have to commit mitzvahs that the core of our religion is loving kindness. That's the core. The core is to be empathic and decent and to train our children. I used to put my kids to bed and say, I'm the luckiest mother in the world. I have such an empathic child. And Amanda would go, what empathic mommy? <laughs> and I say, that's to feel with people. You know, I talked to them like they were 17 years old. They were three, but I didn't care. Anyway, I, 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 I love you so much. You know, you walk into a room and you think what is wanted and needed in this room. And if somebody needs things, you know that sharing is caring. And, and you're so wise. You're so wise. And I would speak to these two and three-year-old kids that were mine. In that way, I would put in them what I wanted for them. Put in them. And that's what my father did for me. He thought I was the greatest thing since French toast. And I was able to imbibe that feeling he had for me and replicate it on the stage. Who do you think's out there in the audience when I'm scared? Mm. A thousand Sydneys, a thousand Sydney Felches. And in the end of her life, the last 20 years of her life, my mother and I were very close, and she gave me great wisdom, which I will impart to you one of the big things she said. And I know I'm off on a tangent about what I do, but this is a really good one. If you are serious about a boy, or a boy is serious about you if you're madly in love, and let me just say, in terms of the 21st century and the millennials, if you are serious about a partner of 
whatever gender they you choose and they are serious about you don't walk run to their parents home if it doesn't feel like a warm bath it's a red flag and don't you ever forget it i'm not saying you can't adjust but maybe not next year do not marry where you have to turn yourself into a pretzel because pretzels break eventually and get eaten so that's what I did. I did not do that. I had seven proposals, and the seventh one was a Harvard lawyer, and my father's a Harvard lawyer, and he was a non-critical male. My father's a non-critical male, and he was successful, and he wanted to be alone sometimes. He reads long form. So I could go do my career. He's a very special man that can tolerate his wife kissing people for money in public. That's a very special guy that has enough core strength. So I found him. And it's been a very successful match, and, and the children are wonderful. And I think I'm in, I'm in my son's house now because Andy thought he tested positive. He had a false positive for COVID, so I couldn't, I couldn't come home from Utah and go to sleep in my bed. I came to Brandon's home, and I'm just about to, to babysit this. Uh, what are you called? A bubby, a safta, a grandma? No, I'm, by Sydney May, I'm called Bodhi, the tree of wisdom. But by uh, Raphael and Camille, I'm called E.E. -E. And E.E., -E, we could not figure out why these, this boy was calling me E.E. -E. It's because it's Grammy. And he couldn't say Grammy. So he could, and he calls Grandy, which is for Andy, which is the greatest name. Grandy, he calls Grandy D.D. So it's D.D. and E.E. -E. But uh, th that's, that's what we're called. And uh, I bought the books for them where you push these, I think they're called Cali books. You push a button and it sings Hebrew songs. For Passover, it's marvelous, sings to the children. I, you know, whenever there, let's say there's a medical challenge where I have to get a shot of platelets in my knee and it's not very pleasant, I'm sitting there to myself mouthing the Shema. It's the weirdest thing, but I do lean on it. I do lean on it. And I go visit my mother in the sea. When I'm in the Hamptons, I go to the sea every day. I used to go in the sea till Thanksgiving every day and visit Lily and talk to Lily, whom I, I love. I love my mother. You know, there's no understudy for a mother. So I hope you're all good ones and good parents. Because there's no understudy for you. No one. And that's that's my life. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm grateful we're alive. I'm grateful we all tested negative. Part of our family completely got COVID. One member came back and gave it to her spouse, her mother, her sister, her baby. It was a mess. And now they're fine. So thank God. Thank God for the, for the inoculations. They were all vaccinated except for the baby. The baby's fine too. Well, I wish that you obviously stay well and yes. we can't wait you. to see everything you have that's still to come um, as an audience member, but also just uh, fans who adore you and are cheering you on because you represent so much about what we're proud about, about art and culture and the traditions of the Jewish community and pride and identity. So I know you you symbolize so much for so many people. This was such a treat on a Friday afternoon to get to talk to you like this. I hope maybe when Lilyville is adapted that maybe we can do a second one and talk about the production. And it, it would be it would be wonderful. And I say to everyone who's watching, I can't see you, but love yourself. You know, you're inside your body only this once. Don't let somebody not get down. Really love yourself. My father gave me that gift. I give you this gift. You can pretend I'm your parent. So you're worth it. You're all worth it out there. Always remember that. You are meaningful in this life. And as a Jewish person, this is, this is not only profound, it's the core of our religion, is, is service and decency and, 